And you are tuned in to Uncommon Sense on 3 Triple R FM with me, Amy Mullins. The tracks we heard just then uh, were a few gorgeous ones. Uh, the last one was by Amo Amo called Canter. Before that, we heard from Lucy Rose with her track Shiver. And at the top of that bracket, we heard a very relevant uh, song to the previous chat. It was called Ancient Rainforests of Gondwana, Superb Lyrebird, and it was a field nature recording by Andrew Skiok in Australia's rainforests, and uh, that was relating to our last chat with Jennifer Ackerman about the birdway. Now, I'm delighted to be able to welcome to the show uh, a really wonderful lineup of guests. I have two fantastic uh, scientists and researchers joining me on this show uh, from Museums Victoria. We are broadcasting live on Facebook, so welcome if you are uh, following along and watching on Facebook, and also welcome to those listening via the radio, of course, and streaming online. Uh, we're going to be chatting now with Dr. Ken Walker, Senior Curator of Entomology at Museums Victoria. And after that, uh, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Jane Melville, who is a herpetologist and is also Senior Curator of Terrestrial Vertebrates at Museums Victoria. And we're going to be talking about some of the really um, wonderful tiny creatures uh, that are really special in Victoria. And, uh, and also beyond Victoria, and particularly looking at some of the things that have been affecting them, particularly their habitats that have been affected by drought and also by bushfire. And of course, that will be very much in the minds of many uh, Victorians and Australians in general, given the uh, really dire bushfires we had over summer. Um, and of course, given that we are also in the middle of a, a pandemic, that is why we are having this set up instead of uh, being over at the museum in person but we're so grateful to have Dr Ken Walker over in the collection area at Museums Victoria right now and uh, I do want to draw your attention briefly to one of the fantastic online digital resources that's on the Museums Victoria website it's called Animals Under Fire and it is one of many digital content pieces that the museum has put together to engage all Victorians and Australians in science and nature and to, I guess, um, provide that access to museums resources and ideas uh, throughout this pandemic because of course so many of these institutions have had to close. Um, we'll give you more details about the opening of Museums Victoria a little bit later on, um, but I do want to welcome now the wonderful Dr. Ken Walker and thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to chat with you. Hello, Amy. How are you? And how everybody else too? I'm good, thank you. Yes, and thank you to the whole team who's put this uh, live to air together because there is a big team behind it. So it's um, great is. that this is all working and very exciting. It's good to see you and it's a shame that we can't be in the same room. But as I said, uh, it's, it's good that we're using now a lot of digital assets to be able to get our message and our stories out there. Exactly, yeah. And it is really great that we've had to, I guess, be forced to um, innovate and make changes and yeah. do things we wouldn't normally choose to do. So uh, yes. yeah, it's yes, very true, cool. True, true, true. I, um, I did hear that you are quite well known in the bee world um, <laughs> and, uh, and you're almost a, a famous kind of living legend in, in bees in Australia. So I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's what 40 years in the business will do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, uh, you either fail or you become a legend, I guess. But yes, uh, no, I, I have been studying bees goodness me, since the, since the 70s, 1970s. Yeah, wow. That's so wonderful. Long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know that you do have a, a really um, keen interest in native bees in particular. Yes, yes. The, uh, it's interesting. Most people know bees from the European honeybee, which was actually brought to Australia in 1822. Uh, it was sailed out on the ship called the Isabella. Uh, and it was brought to Australia because the settlers wanted to have a bit of honey uh, in their tea. And also they had brought across a whole range of European plants, particularly fruit trees, and the native bees weren't pollinating them. So they needed to bring them out. And the last thing, which is really interesting, is that native bees native Australian bees don't make hives and don't make colonies so they don't have wax 
And so the settlers, uh, the colonists, needed wax from honeybees to make candles. So <laughs> it, it was candles, um, uh, agriculture, and, and honey in your tea, uh, why they bought the European honeybee. Now it's throughout most of Australia, uh, but um, as I said, uh, most people think of the, it's, it's even a native, but of course it was introduced, but we actually have, well, it, it's around about 2000, it's about 1700 species of native Australian bees. Uh, and that's around about 20% of the world fauna of about 20,000 species. And they do an awful lot of pollination. Um, they're much smaller than the uh, European honeybee. So they're not seen as much, but they are the big pollinators, particularly of the Australian native plants. Mm. And um, they do seem like they are, uh, you know, an important role. They have an important role to play in the ecosystem. And um, we were talking off air about, you know, the the visual um, distinctiveness or not of yes. native bees and that a lot of people might uh, see a native bee and think perhaps it might be a wasp or a fly because they don't really... Um, well, not all of them. Some of them are very visually distinct, but a lot of them can look like other insects. They do. They do. I've got a couple of examples here. One of the characteristics of the, oh, I'll hold these up in a moment. Yep. One of the characteristics of the native Australian fauna is because Australia has been isolated for literally millions of years and uh, the bees co-evolve with one of the most primitive plant families in the world, the Myrtaceae, which are our eucalypts and, and our gum trees and angophoras. So we have the extreme primitive uh, dominance of bees in Australia. Almost everywhere else in the world, the dominance are the more advanced groups. These are the, the advanced groups, the ones that have got a long tongue, like a honeybee has got a very long tubular tongue. Whereas yeah. most of the native Australian bees have got, we call it a mop. It's just a very short and blunt. Uh, now, if you think about a eucalypt flower, it's a very broad, shallow cup. So the native Australian bees simply have to sit on the side of this broad shallow cup and lap, almost like a dog licking up uh, a water bowl, and they simply lap the nectar. So we have a <laughs> dominance of them. Now, one of the characteristics of this group is that they don't have hairs on the outside of their body. So they do not look like bees. Uh, they look very much yeah. like flies. And you can see the size. Uh, mm. I've got another one here. A number of the native Australian bees are about two millimetres in yeah, body tiny. length. So very tiny. Um, it's interesting, whenever I go to collect uh, native bees, I get the blue sky behind the flowers and all I see is a shimmer, a shimmer <laughs> of light. And it's all these tiny, tiny little native bees that are buzzing around the flowers. Uh, and as I said, that's when I know that I've got bees up there to be able to go. But, but most people would recognize them as flies or wasps rather than bees. And, and interestingly, because these bees don't have hair on the outside of the body, and normally bees use hair to carry pollen back to where they need it, these bees swallow it. So in the stomach, the first part of the stomach is called the crop and they swallow it. And then literally when they get back to be able to make their pollen ball, they vomit it up uh, and bring it back up and then create a little pollen ball on that. So, so we have one of the most unique native bee faunas in the world and it's quite different to anything else and most people wouldn't recognise them as bees at all. No, I think that we perhaps don't get a chance to appreciate them uh, in our surrounds like we do the honeybee, which yep. is so distinct, isn't it? It is, um, it is. Yes, it is. The other big difference is that the honeybee uh, is an extremely social bee. Um, you know, there's a queen inside and then there's a whole lot of, actually the drones are just produced from time to time, the males, but then literally inside, it's all run by sterile females uh, and there can be up to 60,000 of them and they do all the work. So it's called eusociality uh, is the term we use. And it's a very altruistic um, society. Um, female worker honeybees have to give up the right to be able to have their own children, their own progeny, which is a huge thing in nature not to pass on your own genes. Mm. And indeed, throughout the whole insect world, only about 2% 
of the entire insects are social. Um, most others are then solitary or, uh, or what we call semi-social. So this giving up the ability to have your own children or pass on your own genes is something that is not very well used or much used, but it is to a high degree uh, in European honeybees. But the native bees, they're mainly just solitary. Uh, mm. They don't have a hive. Um, all the females produce their own eggs and about 70% dig a hole in the ground and then they make, a, they, they make a little cell and then they provision the cell with what we call a pollen pudding. It's just a whole lot of pollen. They then lay an egg, close it up and go away. So mother never meets daughter. Whereas oh, wow. In the, whereas in the honeybee world, it's all social. And um, it's interesting. Uh, don't come back as a honeybee worker, sterile female. Yet they, they live for about six weeks. They work so hard. Uh, they live for about six weeks, whereas the native bees live for about six months. Right. And what do you think, you know, it's amazing that there is such a contrast between the European honeybees that are very much collaborative and they have, they're just so in tune with each other and have this great way of communicating with each other. I was wondering, you know, with the native bees that you're talking about, even you're saying they're solitary, does that mean that they don't spend much time communicating or interacting with other bees? They hardly communicate or interact at all. There, there's really no need. Um, they will all go to similar flowers and they'll buffet each other when they're at the flowers on that. Yeah. But the male, the main communication would then be with the opposite sex, with the males. Um, that the, the males will meet them at the flowers or will meet them at the nest entrances. Uh, and really once mating is over, again, the association is gone. So they are very solitary uh, bees. And as I said, um, they they, they do the job that needs to be done and very mm. effectively, uh, but they do it singly rather than 60,000 or more <laughs> all working towards the common cause on that. So um, I find it interesting that sociality mm. is not something that's favoured uh, in the insect world. It's, it's But it's interesting, uh, although we've got uh, about 2% uh, of insects that are, um, uh, that are social, they make up about 95% of the biomass or the weight so, for example, um, one of the other social groups are ants. Uh, and in mm -hmm. Africa, there can be a billion individuals within a single ant colony. So, as I said, 2% social, but 95% of the biomass or the weight uh, of the insects on that. So, um, so yes, um, each one does it quite differently, without a doubt. Yeah, it's fascinating, that difference. And um, in terms of that... Um, role in pollination that native bees play they seem to have that kind of unique um, focus of course honeybees do interact with native plants but I wonder what is that special role that they play that differentiates them from the introduced species I'll give you a good example I have another group over here um, have you heard of the blue banded bee Yes. Great. Well, very I've got pretty. Some, they are very nice. Here's some blue banded bees. Oh, wow. and, and, and here's an interesting thing. Um, what makes the blue banded bee unique? This is, these are native Australian uh, bees, and they do occur elsewhere, uh, is that pollination. Now, in most cases, the male part of the flower is called the anther. And let's say, for example, my finger is an anther, and it has pollen on the outside of the anther. So any bee can come along and simply scrape. What they do is they scrape with their forelegs, they transfer it from the forelegs to the mid legs, and then onto the hind legs, usually where the pollen carrying hairs are, or they swallow it. However, there's a group of plants called the Solanaceae, and these are your potatoes, your tomatoes, your nightshades. And let's say again, my finger is the anther. Instead of the pollen being on the outside, the anther is a hollow tube. It's called porosidial, and the it's a hollow tube, and the pollen grains are on the inside. So you can't scrape them. So mm. what you need is a bee that come along and will wrap its body around this hollow tube and then it changes its wing beat uh, from a low buzz to a high buzz. And what it does is it causes the pollen grains to vibrate and they vibrate inside this hollow tube and then finally fire out the end. Uh, I'm gonna sound silly here, but I'm gonna try and make the sound uh, of this buzz pollination. So when they're flying along, it's kind of a brrrr. But when they go around on top of the of this hollow anther, it goes to much higher frequencies, so it's brrr, and then 
So as that that causes the pollen grains to fly around. Now there are very few bees who are good buzz pollinators. European bees don't buzz pollinate. So that's why if you've got tomato plants in your back garden and you see honeybees um, trying to visit them, they're not going to do a very, very good job of pollinating and you won't get a great crop. But but if you have the uh, the blue the blue banded bees coming along, you can sit and listen to this brr, bzz, brr, bzz, and you get a great <laughs> you'll get a great a great crop. So different types of pollen requires different types of techniques to collect it and then different bees have different hair structures to carry because pollen grains come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and so different bees have got different ways to carry it effectively and efficiently and so in a single group like the european honeybee you can't suit all the different types out there the honeybee is a tremendous pollinator um, i saw some stats the other day in australia the pollination services of the european honeybee is worth about 15 billion dollars and we sell about 100 million dollars worth of honey uh, the product so it's tremendous for our for our economy but there are many plants that they're not very good at yeah that's really interesting and it um it made me think of the different plants and vegetable gardens people might have in their backyard yes and uh, perhaps they need to think about and make sure they're attracting the right kind of pollinators so that they have a good crop it's interesting i gave a talk recently to a permaculture group uh and one of the things i said it suddenly sprung them all up uh they didn't realize that 70 percent of the bees these blue banded bees they nest in the ground so if in a permaculture as is normally the case you cover all of the ground with with pea straw or whatever and you don't have any bear patches the bees mm. have got nowhere to nest so that is amazing. You, you just won't have it. And it was a revelation yeah. to them. And, <laughs> and so it was great that, you know, um, it, it's really interesting when when I get to groups with, with gardeners and I talk about pollinators and the gardeners talk about that. And then we finally come together. Uh, mm. But as I said, this group was very fascinated when I said, you need to leave bare patches because that's where the bees are going to be nesting. And without the bees nesting, you won't have that. Because these things fly 500 metres, uh, 700 metres at the most. They're not long flies. So if yeah. you don't have them nesting, thing in your local area you just won't be able to get them that's so cool and really clearly a very important fact to know so i'm glad we do know that uh <laughs> you are you are tuned into uncommon sense on three triple r fm and we are streaming live on facebook through the triple r facebook page which you can do by searching triple r in facebook we're also obviously uh streaming through the radio if you're listening through that medium and i'm speaking with dr ken walker who is uh, the Senior Curator of Entomology at Museums Victoria. And Ken, if you can see him, is situated around his collection with some gorgeous uh, yeah, wooden cases, I guess, behind you. Um, you were saying they're actually from 1901. That's correct. Um, we've got ones there from, these cabinets were, were built in 1901. Actually, I've pulled out, I've just got another drawer here. I'm just going to get it very gently. Now, here's another drawer of insects. Uh, and down in the bottom right-hand corner is uh, the pair of hawk moths and there's a label. And I'm going to read the label to you. And the label reads, uh, taken in Caroline in the West Cows on the Isle of Wight, 28th of August, 1796 by my friend, Mrs. Thompson. So that's, those specimens were collected in 1796. These drawers were made about 1820. And that's what museums are about. Mm. Um, we have the real specimen. So I can pull a leg off that uh, and do a DNA. But more importantly, uh, I have a physical specimen that I can attach to a temporal record, a date. So we can put a dot in the map and we can know that that species occurs there. If I didn't have that specimen and someone said to me in a pub, oh, my great, great, great grandfather told me he saw a hawk moth in the Isle of Wight and said, well, there's, there's no evidence behind it because mm. science is evidence-based. So as I said, that's one of the reasons why museums do have these 100, 200 year old specimens so that we can know. This is a very interesting specimen uh, from the point of view uh, that it really, it only occurs in North America, but it was found in the Isle of Wight in England. And the reason was uh, these things are pests of corn. 
and the Isle of Wight was a great trading port. And so corn would have been transported by ships from North America to the Isle of Wight. And most likely, it's a perfect specimen, so most likely when they left North America, it was still a caterpillar. <laughs> And during the transport, <laughs> they pupated. And when they got to the Isle of Wight, uh, they came out. So even the specimens, it was one of the, probably the one of the first examples of biosecurity failure yeah. <laughs> in, in England by having those specimens. So there's a whole stories. It's one, of, one mm. of my jobs here is to tell the stories of the 2 million specimens that we have in the insect collection and the museum's got about 17 million. So we're storytellers, I guess what we are. Mm. And there's fascinating stories around specimens from over 200 years ago. So, so yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting specimen, 1796. That's amazing. Yes, the Isle of Wight is pretty remote um, off the, the coast yeah. of England. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, your role as well is a, a very important one in the sense of um, your your job is to kind of look in depth and very closely at insects and um, understand them, but also to name them and identify different species. And I know you've had very important role in um, naming different species and identifying them for others when they come calling and ask for your advice. And I wonder, um, how do you approach that task of trying to identify some of these for example, native bees, which do yep. look quite similar in from a, a layperson's perspective. They do, they do, they do. Um, I'll begin by saying behind me, the cabinets uh, contain specimens and I call it my book. So I go to my book, which has got referenced or already named the specimens and I pull drawers out and then under the microscopes, I might count the number of hairs or look at the shape of the antennae or whatever. So these are called morphological characters. Uh, nowadays, we also can use genetic characters. We can do DNA and pull things out. But the important thing is the name because the scientific name I give or identify allows us to go into the literature, whether it be on the web or whether in books, and that then opens everything up and we can find it. Is it a pest? Is it a, is it a pollinator? Is it useful? Is it not? Now, one of the very great issues we have uh, worldwide uh, are the number of named, particularly insects. Um, if you're a backboned animal or an invertebrate, if you're a frog or a mammal, uh, almost 98% of all species are known. However, mm -hmm. in the invertebrate wheel, world, uh, only about 30%. So in Australia, uh, in Australia, there's about 220,000 named species, but there's over 600 thousand species there so think of all we don't know about think of all the names that i can't put on them so when i put a name on a species it actually gives it meaning so i gave i, I and, and we use uh, latin names I'll, I'll give you an example yeah. I, I called a species called um uriglacina um uh, it was called by pedalis now, bi means two, trico means hair, and pedalis means foot. So it had these two great big hairs on the end of its foot. Now, I could have said two great big hairs on the end of the foot or bi trico pedalis. But by giving that name, other collections around Australia could attach that name to their specimens. And then when they get registered and we aggregate the data, suddenly we can get distribution maps of where it occurred. Without a name, there's no distribution map. Now, being a bee, we can also have the pollination or the visitation records. So suddenly we begin, begin to get the biology of it. So the name also gives us, apart from meaning, it gives us a perception of the species in nature. Now, yeah we have these endangered species. If it hasn't got a name, we don't know it's endangered. And so we can't preserve it, protect it or preserve it. If we want to look at a species, we need to know, is it a very widespread species or is it what we call a short range endemic? In other words, it only occurs in a, in a very local area. And as I said, many of the bees only fly 500 meters anyway. So they're often these very short range en endemics. So this is where, for example, a bushfire uh, coming through will entirely wipe out the habitat. Um, some of the eucalypts will take seven years to reflower after, uh, after a major bushfire. So what's the food source? Where do they go? Um, mm. So yeah, um, if we don't even know what's in the area, 
we don't even know what we're losing. And this is one of the things that we are now looking to do, to go out and do surveys, uh, to be able to look at what's left, uh, what's regenerating. Um, we expect that the generalist pollinators uh, will come back first because normally after bushfire weeds will establish very quickly, uh, whereas the more specialist pollinators will probably take quite some time to be able to come back on that. I have mm. an example here of a beautiful, <clears throat> a beautiful bee. Uh, it's called the green metallic carpenter bee. And this bee used to occur uh, all the way from southeast Queensland, all the way down the east coast of Australia, across Victoria and into South Australia. The last sightings of this bee in Victoria was in the 1930s. So the extinct money through agriculture and land clearing. These bees like to nest in grass tree stems. You know, grass trees have got the big spike, the big flower spike. And after about two years, the middle dries out. And that's where they like to be able to nest. Well, they had on uh, Kangaroo Island was the last place where these bees occurred in South Australia and mainly on the western end. So they put out about 400 of artificial nesting stems stalks or stems and about 200 of them were being used so there was a great population of the green carpet to be coming back mm. and of course the bushfires on kangaroo island were mainly down on the western end and all of these artificial nesting stalks have been now wiped out so it looks like this species has now become extinct across southern australia and it's going it's still on the on the uh, up along the great dividing range in new south wales and southeast queensland but again the habitat and the distribution is reducing and reducing and reducing uh, mm -hmm. through, through, so just through money through habitat loss on that. So imagine losing something as large as that yeah. across Southern Australia. So it just goes to show how dedicated and how in tune they are with their habitat. And if mm. changes occur to the habitat through agriculture or through, um, uh, through bushfires, then you can have severe impacts very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm so glad you t uh, brought up the green metallic carpenter bee because they are just so striking visually yeah. Yeah. and they are actually metallic. It has this beautiful <laughs> emerald colour. It might be difficult to tell, but yeah, it is just phenomenal. They almost kind of look like a bee cross between a spider because they have those thick legs. and They do, they do. Yeah. Big, big hairy legs and that. These are also good buzz pollinators, another another one of the group that go around the, uh, the hollow the hollow anther. But yes, it was a magnificent bee, but 1930 was our last record in Victoria. Um, gone now probably from, from Kangaroo Island, uh, but still around <clears throat> between Sydney and Brisbane are, are where there are still populations. But they had fires up along those ways as well. So mm. as I said um these things but the trouble is as i said only knowing 30 percent of the fauna there's 70 percent we don't know and that's mm. one of my jobs is to put names on animals and then once we put a name on an animal other people can use it we can begin to aggregate literature and then specimen records and then we begin to put knowledge around a species without that name we have no knowledge with the name, we can aggregate information. So a major role that museum staff do is to put names, we're taxonomists, and we put names on animals. Most of the vertebrates, as I said, have been done, but imagine the marine environment. Again, you've got you know a, such a huge amount. So we have quite a large marine environment as well. So yes. as I said, um, putting names on animals is what museums do. Then of course, people come in and they want something identified. So I go to my book uh, behind mm -hmm. me, and then I'll give you I'll give you a good example. The one I use Rick, for everybody uh, are termites. In Australia, there are 330 species of termites, of which only eight can cause you problems. So, and a termite infestation may cost you ten thousand dollars. So, if you haven't got one of these eight species of termites that can cause you problems, then you know you're wasting your money. Now, you could even bring me in a termite and say, I found this termite eating wood in my house. What should I do? And I could say to you, you haven't got a termite problem. And the reason would be around the base of the shower, the, the grouting has gone and water has sipped through, or you've got a leaking pipe and the wood below has rotted. Mm, and only yeah. because the wood is rotted are the termites there. So the solution is to reseal the grouting, uh, fix the dripping pipe, uh, replace the wood, and your termite problem is gone. Uh, so we have these groups called wet 
and dry termites. The wet termites aren't a problem. They're because of they're just high humidity. It's the dry wood termites that cause your problem. So mm -hmm. one of the things that people should always get before you get a termite infestation, do I have one of these eight out of 330 species that will cause me problems? And there are down in Melbourne here, some very nasty termites that can destroy your house. Uh, yes. So it's, it's something you need to be careful <laughs> of. But as I said, you can have termites in your house and not require a termite infestation. Yeah, Ken, we're running out of time, but I did just want to quickly ask you one final question, which was about um, one type of insect that I know a lot of people have a really strong connection with and love uh, looking at in their backyards, and that's beetles. Yes. Um, and we've, you know, talked about a range of beetles like ladybirds and, um, of course, the Christmas beetle, which is also metallic and very visually striking. And I know a lot of people growing up would have got used to seeing the Christmas beetle kind of pattering around out their veranda and I think a lot of people have said anecdotally that you know they don't see as many beetles um, nowadays are there reasons for that and is that really the case there is in fact I do have a drawer here of Christmas beetles oh, yay. And, and you can see the wonderful oh, metallic wow. the Gorgeous. metallic colors of them there and look they were a, they are a favorite around Christmas time now yeah. these are the adults but the larvae or the grub stage uh, needs to feed underground on rotting wood. Now, of course, we had the millennial drought in, in the 2000s and we've had another huge drought. So again, the habitat, uh, a lot of the moist underground wood has dried out. And so it hasn't been available for the grubs of the Christmas beetles to be able to feed on. So there's been a massive drop, massive loss of the number of specimens, which is why people are reporting that they don't mm. see them much more. Hopefully, if we go back into a semi or a sustained wetter period and more underground wood uh, actually gets to the stage of being able to support these beetles, they'll come back in large numbers. But it's primarily a drought. As I keep saying, you change the habitat, you change the species. Yeah, uh, it's and so this, critical. It's so critical. And this is why, as I said, it's the droughts that have caused the major. And we've really been in drought since about 2000. Mm, yeah. Massive yeah. droughts across Australia. In fact, I was watching something last night and there were still parts of, uh, of, of Western New South Wales still in drought out there. Mm. So it's the drought that has caused the drop off in these, um, in these beautiful um, uh, Christmas beetles. Hopefully yeah. they'll come back. Hopefully they'll oh, come back. Cross fingers. <laughs> I, f I feel I'm glad that um, it's not just an anecdotal observation that it's true because I true. felt like I was getting, you yeah. know, is it, have I just made it up? I swear yeah. I used to see them. <laughs> yes, no, no, they, they have dropped off in enormous numbers and, and yeah. it's purely that the larvae are dying and there's not the food for the larvae. So as I said, mm. the female can lay as many eggs, but if the larvae don't have their preferred food, uh, then the generation turnover won't occur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been so great to chat with you, Ken, and uh, you've really highlighted the importance of habitat and the effects of uh, things like bushfire and drought on these really important species and, more importantly, being able to name and identify them so yes. we can conserve them. Yes. So yes. Um, thank you so much for joining us through uh, Zoom and over there in Museums Victoria's wonderful collection of invertebrates and, uh, and insects, and it's uh, great to chat with you today. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, Amy. And as I said, if you want to know about insects, the museum's the place to come. Thanks oh, for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I've been chatting there with Dr. Ken Walker and we are going to be crossing to Dr. Jane Melville and uh, we're going to be chatting all about some amphibians and reptiles, which is very exciting. And I don't know if I'm the only one who finds them cute, but we'll soon find out. And, uh, and I'm really pleased to, uh, to welcome Jane to the show. And I also um, should mention Jane is a herpetologist and she's also senior curator in terrestrial uh, ecology and, and the like. So it's very exciting to welcome Jane and chat about her, um, her research and field work, uh, talking about in particular, uh, a couple of species that are really um, important in Victoria. They're quite rare and um, are found in East Gippsland. And uh, they're the Martin's toadlet and the green and golden bell frog. Um, and then we're going to touch on uh, the wonderful grassless earless, grassland earless dragon lizard. So I welcome uh, Dr. Jane Melville now. Hi, how are you, Amy? 
Hi, I'm doing well, Jane. It's uh, lovely to chat with you and meet you. It's great to come and talk about things that I love so much. Yes, and I love the photo in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a photo of an illustrator, which we'll talk about. Um, this one's actually from Queensland, up on the Darling Downs. It's a species that I named a few years ago. So, oh, wow. Yeah, I thought it was a great name picture. It. Uh, condominensis, Tympanocryptus condomite, the condomine earless dragon for the river that wow. runs through the, the Darling Downs. So. Oh, wow. That's really awesome. Um, yeah. It looks like it's kind of standing up and facing the sun. That's right. They like sitting up on little clumps of dirt. They're only about um, uh, perhaps eight centimetres long. So if you want to see the oh, world, wow. you've got to get up there. So that's a, a stand they do, standing up on their back legs um, to look out at the world. Yeah, um, that's so cool. We'll get to uh, to that um, very broad species and then we'll narrow down into uh, Victoria a bit later on. But I did want to ask about um, some of your research and um, you're looking at really interesting species of frogs and amphibians. Yes. yes. And um, I don't know if anyone else thinks this, but I feel like they're really cute. And I know they're probably slimy maybe to feel, um, but they they are pretty gorgeous. And uh, the ones that we're talking about in particular, um, the Martin's toadlet and uh, the green and golden bell frogs are particularly visually striking and, and interesting to look at. Yeah, the green and golden bell frog, um, you find it in, uh, in Victoria, you find it in eastern Victoria, and we've been working on them down in Gippsland, and they're a bright green frog, basically, and quite a big one, too. They're quite, they're one of the larger um, of the uh, tree frog um, group in Australia. Although they don't actually occur up a tree, they actually live on the ground, but they're bright green, so they're, and when they call, so they, 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 um, uh, call in summer and they sound a bit like a motorbike starting <laughs> up so um, I'm not going to do an impersonation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to attempt it it's not my talent <laughs> and the Martin's toadlet's very different it's a tiny frog and you probably wouldn't even notice it um, if you walked past a pond um, tiny little brown frog but when it moves it's got these uh little bright yellow patches on its arms that you can only see when it when it moves so it's a pretty cool little frog too it's almost reminds me of um cyclists having to wear safety vis and it's got like you know a bit of a yes. bright holographic piece on yeah. the side yeah yeah it's yeah. like that yeah and um, and it is really cute. How large is it? Like I know that it dwells in the ground and under leaves and, you know, if it's so small, potentially it's maybe more vulnerable to um, predators and other types of things. Yeah, I don't know that the size makes it more vulnerable because I suppose it's, it can hide, hide. more easily mm. than, say, the great big bright green uh, <laughs> bell frog. But it's about um, perhaps uh, a bigger one might be a couple of centimeters long so so little really maybe. small really yeah small yeah and they they've not got a big booming call like the belt frogs either they're quite different they 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 just have a little croak that uh, when you go and work out um in the field looking for them you go to a pond where you think they might be often there's a really big loud chorus of something like the bell frogs or the parents tree frog which is also sometimes called the maniacal cackling frog it's very loud and the uh, Martin's toadlet is just I'll give it a try it's just like a eh, like that and yeah, you've right. got to try and hear that in this deafening chorus of all these other frogs. So you're trying to listen for eh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is important though, isn't it? The call that they give out because it can actually help to distinguish between species that may look similar. Yes, exactly. And that's um, there are a number of species, even in Victoria, that the only way to really tell them apart um, is to listen to their call. And they look pretty much identical to us anyway, but it's their call that's different. And it's the call, it's the males calling to the females. Um, so they sit around the ponds in um, breeding season and they 
uh, have their particular distinctive call that's for their species and that's what the females um, uh, listen out for, I suppose. Mm. So it's the males making the calls. Yeah, that's in- interesting that they're the vocalising uh, sex in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking with Dr. Jane Melville and we are talking about frogs at the moment and we will be talking about uh, dragon lizards very, very soon. And uh, Jane is a scientist based at Museums Victoria and we are streaming live on Facebook through Triple R's Facebook page and, of course, going to you live through the radio as well. Um, Jane, I really want to ask about uh, the green and golden bell frog because I read that it has at times uh, engaged in cannibalism ah some of the the larger frogs i i had not read that but it's there are some of the larger frogs they will eat things that are smaller basically sometimes just something wandering past that's smaller and they can fit in their mouth they will eat it so i am quite sure that a larger green and golden bell frog might um, eat something smaller than it (laughs) <laughs> and even even some of the tadpoles too. Some oh, some right. tadpoles are are quite cannibalistic as well. So when they're in their tadpole phase. Mm. And I did listen to a sound recording of a green and golden bell frog, and I think that's the one I thought sounded like a cow mooing. Yes, so... it's often described as a motorbike frog sometimes, because it sounds like a motorbike starting up revving. At some, yeah. I'm not even going to attempt it. It would be completely embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, actually you can listen to the sound recording on the Museums Victoria website because yes, that is right, how I there. heard it. Yes, yeah. they're so all there. It up. And there's also um, it's sister species which you find around Melbourne, although it is a threatened species now and declining, is called the growling grass frog. Some people might have heard of that. And it looks quite similar to the green and golden bell frog, although it's got more warty, lumpy skin. Mm. And it also has a similar sound. So if if you happen to be out and about in summer in, at night near the wetlands and you hear something that sounds a bit like a motorbike starting up, it could be a <laughs> growling grass frog. That's so cool. I, I know that a lot of people might, you know, think of summer and and have an idea of what the soundtrack of summer could be, like cicadas and also the sounds of frogs, depending on where you live and, um, you know, whether you have bodies of water nearby or what types of, of frogs are in your area. And uh, some people have commented, depending on where they live, that they seem to have heard frogs less in more recent years. And I wondered... You know, what are some of the challenges when um, trying to preserve and look after some of these frogs that are particularly rare and found only in certain parts? And, you know, thinking about these two in particular, I know they're found in East Gippsland and um, have certainly been in an area where their habitat has been under threat uh, by bushfire, of course. But also, do you, what are some of those kind of environmental factors that, um, that can be a threat to these these gorgeous little frogs yeah there, there are a lot of reasons and i actually hear that quite often mm. talking to people they're like we used to hear frogs all the time particularly out on the outskirts of melbourne and they're like we used to hear them all the time we just don't hear them like we used to and there are a whole range of reasons one of the top of the list is habitat loss and that can be through all kinds of um avenues, um, you know, land clearing, uh, um, growing suburban areas, um, forestry, a whole range of things. So top of the list, probably habitat losses. Mm. And then there's also a disease, a fungal disease that has hit frogs globally called chytrid fungus. And a number of frog species are particularly vulnerable to that. In the bell frogs, the, the growling grass frog and the green and golden bell frog are known to be very vulnerable to that. And it's one of the reasons it's thought that they're declining. Um, and then there's a whole lot of um, other things that you can add to that list on why frogs are in trouble, uh, on impacts of climate change in some areas, uh, feral predators, which um, are, uh, things like fish for the tadpoles. If you have a pond in your your garden 
that has um, fish in it, they may eat the tadpoles, things <laughs> like that. So, so they, and, and run off from, run off from uh, land into pond and river systems mm. that damage frogs. So there's a whole range of things that, that the frogs are facing. And um, some species are more vulnerable to certain ones of these than others. So you do see some species that are quite common and abundant still and others that are obviously more susceptible to some of these things. Yeah. And I know that uh, drought plays a role as well, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And and we were working down in Gippsland. Um, we were uh, out looking for the Martin's Toadlet um, a couple of years ago, and it had been some very dry years there. And we were visiting ponds where they had been recorded previously, and we were not finding them. It, a mm. lot of those ponds and... Um, uh, small wetlands were dry and they looked like they'd been dry for quite a while. So we want to go and return there to see um, how these fires have impacted the, the frogs, particularly the Martin's toadlet, and whether they're, they're managing to return after some good rain. Because just because you're not seeing them there in summer at these areas that have dried out doesn't mean they're not there. But obviously mm. I think these... these um, periods of aridity um, really impact these frogs. Yeah. And in terms of the field work that you're doing going out to these areas, what are some of the aims that you would have uh, in terms of surveying them and and analysing them? So what we mainly do at the museum, my my particular focus is looking at their genetics. So we do a kind of research called conservation genetics where we go out and use... um, genetic techniques to um, look at uh, things like inbreeding and how species are connect, uh, the populations within species are connected to each other, um, how, um, whether there might be declines in genetic diversity, things like that. Mm. So um, we're particularly focused on that and also taxonomy. So as a museum, one of our core duties is naming and documenting new species and so I combine conservation genetics and also taxonomy which is looking at what species are out there. Sounds like a really fun job and uh, never a dull moment. No uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> every job has dull moments so just, but, uh, <laughs> getting out in, um, to go out and see these animals um, and how they're doing is really fantastic. So, yeah and I, I did it. I heard that they're kind of difficult to reach in some spots. Like you do have to make a bit of an effort to go out there and, you know, get amongst it. Yes. And and even uh, down at Gippsland, there is um, a lot of areas down there there, um, that are not easy to get into that are pretty remote. Mm. You wouldn't think that Victoria has really remote areas. You think out in the desert in the middle of Australia, but down in Gippsland, there's some really rugged terrain land down there that's yeah it is a great part of victoria of course Mm, and uh, i do want to touch on something a little bit closer to triple r in a sense um which is the grassland earless dragon um not to be uh, confused with a mythical dragon but a a no (laughs) so dragon lizards are a family of lizards that the scientific name is um agamids which we call dragons in Australia. And they include things like um, the frill neck lizard, bearded dragons, which are quite a popular pet lizard, and um, uh, uh, Molochs, um, the thorny devils, and the one I have a photo of here, which is a a yellow dragon. So there's about a bit over 100 species of different dragons in Australia. And in terms of this one that uh, lives in the grasslands or did, um, live in the grasslands. We're talking about a kind of outer Melbourne area around Werribee and Little River. Yes. So um, back when Melbourne was uh, uh, in the very early days, back in the 1800s, these little grassland dealer dragons were actually found. Some of our old records are in grasslands in St Kilda. So it's really strange to think that there were grasslands in St Kilda. Yeah. But um, so they occurred in inner Melbourne and then down towards Geelong. And so gradually, of course, those habitats disappeared as 
um, Melbourne grew and the habitat for these lizards shrunk and shrunk. And mm. the last time they were seen um, was in the late 1960s, an actual animal was seen. So Zoos Victoria has an amazing uh, fighting extinction list now, and this species is one of them, and they're out doing fantastic work trying to find these, these grassland earless dragons. And I, I really, really hope they manage to find these. And so I've been doing some taxonomic work um, on these earless dragons because they were, um, uh, there was one species in these isolated populations around Melbourne, up around Canberra, up on the Monaro High Plains and in Queensland where these ones were. And I did the taxonomic work with some genetics and found that they were all actually separate species. So there's That's so now, great. There's now, um, I think eight species of the grassland earless dragons instead of just the one. Wow, that's so cool. And surely if Zoos Victoria thinks they found the grassland earless dragon, they'll um, refer the, the, the dragon on to you? Uh, I, I, well, <laughs> Maybe? I don't know. I think that they'd, they'd put kind of um, big fences around it, try and protect it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, they're, they're out doing survey work in the grasslands around, around, um, around Western Melbourne to try and find these lizards. Mm. I kind of did the, the, the taxonomic work so that, that said, yes, this should be its own species. And they're, they're doing the hard work going out and looking for it now. So. Yeah. Well, it is important, as you've said, uh, in other formats, that it's important not to declare it extinct because it might mean we stop looking um, yes. and that it is yes. possible to be there given that they are pretty good at hiding and they're they are. die. And, some, and I, I, I believe um, that, that they've still got areas they need to survey, so we need to kind of check everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Let's hope. I'm crossing my fingers. Yes, that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Jane, it's been so wonderful to chat with you and to uh, get an insight into the world of frogs and dragon lizards. And I really am grateful for the work you do and also Ken, of course, who we were chatting with earlier. And uh, people can head on to Museums Victoria's website um, to engage with some of the species we've just been talking about on the Animals Under Fire page. Um, but there is a lot more. So thank you, Jane, for chatting with us today. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Just a pleasure. And uh, for people who do want to engage more with the online collection that the museum has put up on their website, they can do so um, on the, the website if you Google through Museums Victoria. Um, and I should note that Melbourne Museum and Science Works are now open with specific measures put in place to support visitor safety, of course, and the Immigration Museum will be opening in August. You can check out all the details online. Um, but as I said, while their doors have been closed, they've been putting some amazing um, research collections, uh, virtual tours of the outdoors and the indoors. You can see some dinosaurs up close through the virtual tours. And, um, and of course, Under Fire, which is an interactive article and features uh, scientists like Jane and Ken uh, talking about these very important little creatures in Victoria and beyond who are under threat from a range of things. And uh, it's been just a joy to uh, broadcast live from Museums Victoria and talk all about it. Uh, I'm going to uh, head to a track and uh, we're going to be hearing from Hani Arani uh, with her track Leaving. And uh, then I'll be back with you to close out this show. And thank you for joining me on the Facebook